The People's Democratic Party PDP presidential aspirant Bukola Saraki announces that the party is making progress to ensure a consensus candidate. And President Muhammad Buhari has signed the highest number of bills since the Fourth Republic began, says the Senate President Ahmed Lawan. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakol. A presidential aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party PDP, Abubakar Bukola Saraki, has said that they are making progress to ensure the emergence of, the, of one consensus candidate. He spoke in an interview with journalists after meeting with delegates of the People's Democratic Party in Kaduna. He noted that the party has a process that unites and is less rancorous. On what he will be doing differently if he became the president of Nigeria, he said he would ensure unity, security, and that the economy works. He added that the country needs a president with empathy. Well, joining us to discuss uh, the issue of consensus and break it down, we have Ilemona Onoja. He's a spokesman for Abubakar Bukola Saraki campaign organization. And we're also being joined by Gbadebo Rhodes Viva. He is a PDP gubernatorial aspirant in Lagos State. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Thank you so much, us. Great, great. Hi, Miriam. Thank you for having us. Great. I'll start with you because this is your um, principal, and um, he's talking about the, um, you know, the issue of consensus, something that may not necessarily be alien to the PDP, but it's not necessarily their modus operandi. Uh, I'll start by asking, what's your position on this issue of consensus, being that um, Bukola Saraki uh, himself actually initiated the idea of a consensus? I mean, he talked about the consensus arrangement um, and that it, it began with three presidential aspirants. Um. First of all, just to correct that impression, the, he, while he was, while he grew to be very fond of the idea and a big promoter of it, he, he wasn't the originator. It was originated um, by, by one of the other governors um, who, were, who was a party to that consensus conversation at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, to address it, our understanding of, of this entire consensus conversation is born out of worry about the sheer number of aspirants on the platform of the party, particularly seeing as the party is in opposition. At the time of this interview, there are 15 presidential aspirants. From our point of view, what that means is that you have 15 um, sets of narratives being promoted within the party. You have possibly 15 camps. You have you know, all sorts of dynamics that are related to the pursuing of the ambition of these 15 aspirants. The, the worry is that this may negatively affect the party. We have just come off the back of a protracted period of crisis. We recall that when Dr. Bukola Saraki, and he should know because of the time he spent as chairman of the National Reconciliation and Strategy Committee, we recall that during the um, 16 months lifespan of that committee, he traveled, traversed the length and breadth of this country and had discussions with leaders and critical stakeholders across the party, much of which has formed the background of his belief that we need to manage properly the um, process that leads to the selection of, a, of, of our presidential candidate later in the month to ensure that we emerge on the other side of the primaries a united, cohesive, and properly functioning political machinery. The idea is if we can one do one of two things. The whole consensus idea is that we can do one of two things. One, we can either emerge with one single consensus candidate around whom everybody else rallies, or two, we can have a smaller bunch of consensus candidates, you know, small groups. People talk to themselves collapse the structures into one another, and then we can reduce the number of candidates or aspirants on the platform of the party so that the process 
is um, less rancorous, it's less divisive, and it's easier to manage such that our party emerges on the other side of the primaries, like I said, a functional, unified political machinery. The PDP has been opposition for eight long, almost eight years, um, meaning that they should obviously know what the problem of Nigeria is and should, I'm saying should, because I do not know if they do have the solutions to Nigeria's problems, being that our problems are multifaceted. But um, if we have 15 of these men who think that they have the solution to Nigeria's problems or are gunning for that revert seat, should it be a difficult um, you know, thing to say, well, since we all have you know, the same idea, or rather we all have a same, you know, the same um, notion in mind, which is to save Nigeria, um, should it be a difficult thing for these men to band behind one person or choose two people who they would all say, let's band behind them and then may the best man win? Should it be that difficult for the PDP, being that uh, they've been in a position for that long and they should be ready? In fact, everybody was hoping that by this time the People's Democratic Party would be ready um, to you know, go for this office without having so many people uh, dragging the, the voters in many directions. I can tell you one thing, right? It, and it is that, without a doubt, the 15 aspirants all are um, motivated by the desire to pull us back and to, from the brink of the eight years or seven years, by next year to the eight years, okay. of APC in this rule, where these 15 men, all people of very good standing in our society, not just by virtue of their political careers, but also by content and character, it lead people like me to be able to say that I can guarantee that however we emerge, whoever emerges on the other side of the prime minister's candidates of the political party will be much better than whoever the APC offers. We, we can say that without equity every vocation. However, what you see is that these people are not only a desire to achieve the ambition, the personal ambition, but also are motivated by a burning passion to ensure that this misrule that the APC has brought us this far into over the course of the last seven years is terminated next year, without a doubt. So it's on the one hand, while you, you, you can say, oh yeah, we do need to talk and, and find a way to line up behind one or two other candidates, we must all also recognize what the motivations are. And the truth about it is, as with motivations such as that, when there is a firm belief in the ability to do better than what we currently have, mm -hmm. um, it, it takes some conversing. It takes some negotiation. It takes quite a lot of consultation and deliberation. One thing that I know is that over the years, the PDP has always proven that it has entrenched with its, within its systems guardrails that guide the party to ensure that it emerges on the other side. We believe that those guardrails will, haven't failed us in the past. We believe that they will not fail us now. Okay. But it will, um Let's talk about the fact that zoning is on the table. Whether the PDP is throwing its ticket open or not, zoning is a conversation that most zones, whether it's PANDEF, whether it's the Middle Belt Forum, whether it's Ohanese, they're having this conversation. And we've heard these groups you know, give ultimatums. They've also said they're not going to throw their weight behind any political party that does not pick somebody from the South. I know that this is a very sensitive issue, but why, did the, why do you think the PDP chose to go the route of throwing the ticket open? Because many people hoped that even if the APC was going to go with a consensus candidate or go to the north, that the PDP would be at least able to listen to the yearnings of the people. Yes, um, there's the yearnings of the people, but like Lemona talked about, there's a process that must allow that your party does not implode, regardless of what people feel is the right way that things should go. Now, there's also a primary process, which is the part where they select the candidate. And all of these leaders have influence in all their states. They have influence on delegates. Pushing all of these conversations 
and highlighting them should also sway the delegates to vote en masse in bloc for a particular candidate that would reflect and embody this zoning values that people are seeking. And I think that in so doing, you come out with a stronger party. Now, everybody will feel, everybody feels that ideally power should shift. That, that has been encoded in the DNA of the PDP. It's something that has always been done. But then people will tell you that those modus operandi were broken by good luck, Jonathan, right? And now you cannot say um, what happened then. You just want to ignore it. But then, and then some other people will tell you that even when Jonathan went to a zone to the south, northern candidates were still coming out, right? So there was also a disrespect for zoning even then. It's just that the party guided, like he said, the guardrails that guide the party to where it's supposed to go. For me, the most, the first and foremost thing in my mind, because I was at the convention that produced um, Atiku Abubakar, as long as there is a free and fair primary, because that is really what the PDB is about. It's very democratic. Once there's a free and fair primary, everybody will rally around the person that emerges from that process. So whether it's 15 candidates or three candidates, I'm not too worried because there's always a way that everybody will come together. Because when you have such, um, such huge, strong political figures, the only way that there can be peace is fairness. Mm and a process of fairness that produces Talking the Talking about candidates. justice and fairness, um, the governor of River State, who is very vocal, uh, Governor Wike, had spoken, um, re-echoing what Governor Gwangi had said about if we were to go with the issue of consensus, that there has to be justice and fairness or yes. fair play. But then you talked about party processes. What's, what's the essence of going through a process and losing the voters? Because again, you as the party, you're giving us the person to, to, that, for, that we will vote for at the end of the day. This is who you're saying your flag bearer is. Yeah. But if that flag bearer does not actually show or uh, mirror what the people want, that means you're losing votes well, to whoever you, you decides to mirror what society is looking for at this you, point. You need to, Again, I'm not calling what the yes. voters are wanting, but I'm saying this is what's been making headlines yes. over time. Yes, and you need to understand that the party is a reflection of Nigeria. In itself, you have delegates that come from every state mm -hmm. and all gather and each of them will cast their votes. So if in Lagos State, delegates are saying power must come to the south and this is what is fair and they cast their votes or your state, they cast their votes. Um, you have Benway State, cast their votes. What should come out of it should be the desire of Nigeria in general. What should come out of that process? So that's why I highlight that. Unlike the APC that's more focused on a consensus or um, in position, as long as that process is free and fair, you should have something that reflects what Nigeria, entirety of it, wants. Talking about what Nigeria wants, uh, Ilemina, what do you think Nigeria wants? I'd like to refer to a statement credited to an elder statesman in the People's Democratic Party, Chief Body George, who has said that uh, the PDP will be defeated in 2023 if it does not zone its ticket, its presidential ticket, to the South. Now, your principal, obviously, is not from the South, neither is he from the Southwest, and he's also gunning for that seat. I'd really love to hear what you have to say. Um, what do I think Nigeria wants? I think that Nigeria wants... I mean, if I was going to be political, I would say that I think that Nigeria wants, if I was going to be purely political, I would say I think that my, Nigeria wants my boss to be president. But um, what does Nigeria want? Nigeria wants a kind, visionary, um, focused, committed, courageous kind of leader. I think that's ultimately what it wants. I think that if we come down to the brass tacks, we will see that the problems that plague us are neither northern nor southern. And security doesn't care whether you come from the north. I don't think that the person who is suffering insecurity in Katsina or Zamfara, or in Benue or Kogi, or in the southwest or the southeast really cares the origin of the person who's going to stop for him. Um, I think that the person who is experiencing hunger in Bauchi or Borono or Kanu or Kaduna doesn't really care who's going to provide food, the origins of who's going to provide food or jobs or unemployment, or employment, sorry. I think that um, 
we, we, we don't really care who's going to stop the origins of the person who's going to stop um, oil theft. That is at unprecedented levels and therefore depriving government of the necessary revenue that we require to grow our country or to provide development. We, 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 I think that when it comes to the brass tacks, Nigerians just want a good, kind, empathetic, sensitive, communicating, visionary, courageous leader. Someone who's going to be able to make the tough decisions that we need to make in a post-Buhari era without necessarily, without being mean about it and who's empathetic and humane in the execution of those decisions. I think Nigerian wants a president who respects the rule of law. I think that Nigerians want a, a, a president who is able to safeguard our institutions. Right now, the, I mean, one of the talking points over the course of the day is that, I mean, the CBN governor is there desecrating the institution of the CBN by being a member of a political party and, and um, purchasing forms to contest for the office of president. We, I think Nigeria wants a president who's not going to let that happen on his watch. doesn't matter where it's from. Just uphold the value and the sanctity of our institutions. I think that Nigeria wants a president that respects the judiciary, that respects the rule of law, that safeguards our constitutional rights and freedoms. I think that's what Nigeria wants. Ultimately, yeah, we will have the conversation about where should he be from. But the truth about it is, when you sift all that away, when you sift all that away, at, at the heart of the matter, it, it, it cannot be determined by origins. It cannot be determined by which God you worship, what language you speak, where you're from. These are, 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 are um, somewhat, and I say this most respectfully, these are additives. I think that at this, con at this point in time, the many Nigerians, like myself, in, in millions, to realize that we're simply too insecure, we're simply too poor, we're simply too hungry, we're simply too unemployed to allow, um, to allow ethnicity and religion be the determinants of our future. I think that that's where we have come to anything. That is fundamental. As good as that sounds, the reality is on the ground is that we are a people that are divided by ethnicity and religion. And the truth of the matter is that these agitations would not stop if something is not done about it. Again, many I'd would like say, hold you. on, hold on. Many have said that why all of a sudden are we saying let's jettison the idea of zoning when it's the, the turn of the south southeast? I mean, you have, um, um, you have uh, former governor Peter B, who is from the southeast. Um, and many people are saying, well, give the southeast an opportunity. Again, I'm not also saying that just give the man the ticket. But why are we all of a sudden saying, oh, Nigeria needs this type of president and that type of president? Does it mean that the Southeast does not have those kinds of people who can also put, put the, to be, who can be put forward for those tickets? Because every time we have this conversation, people always say, oh, that's, Nigeria doesn't need someone whose you know, ethnicity is not the solution to the problem. But then we've had a gentleman's agreement, whether it's written or not, that there are, these tickets would be zoned. Now the Southeast is saying... Let's have, you know, an opportunity at it. And the PDP saying, no, let's throw it open. May the best man win. Let me tell you something. And um, one of the reasons why from the Bukola Tarki campaign organization, we try not to focus on, on a historical recount of how we got to that conclusion that, you know what, throw it open, may the best man win, is that it, it can be a little divisive and people can easily get offended by it. And we believe that to be able to win this elections, the, the elections in 2023, you need a united, cohesive, fully functional party machinery. Otherwise, if we answer the question, you cannot talk in all honesty about a lack of or throwing the ticket open in 2022 without first talking about 2010 and 2011 or 2015. You simply can't. If you do a historical recount, you will realize that in 2010, when President Goodluck Jonathan got into office, there was agitation in certain parts of the country who said it was the turn of the North. 
And the zoning principle was violated then, was it not? You will recall also that in 2015, that, no, sorry, in 2010, as part of the negotiations to get the ticket, there was a signed agreement and copies of that agreement are on social media that said, I will run for only one term. That was violated also. You will recall that in furtherance of the second violation, in 2015, in 2014, in the build-up to the 2015 elections, there was only one set of forms printed and sold to any aspirant to contest for the office of President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria on the platform of PDP. Again, public information. Now, if you take into consideration all these things and you continue a cycle of, oh, you violated, oh, you violated, what will happen is that we will never have a functional party machinery. And without a functional party machinery, you simply cannot win elections. It's really that simple. So it's a little, it's a little curious that people only want to discuss history in the context of 2022, 2023, without wanting to discuss the contextual history of 2010, 2011, and 2014, 2015. If we're going to do a historical mm -hmm. conversation, do the entire history of the party, starting from 2010, when the zoning principle was first violated. But in our camp, and equally uh, increasingly resonating around the country, leave that alone. Don't do that historical recount. Why? It will simply further divide the party. Very simply. Instead, let us come to a place where, you know what? We have never denied that there are competent people within the ranks of the PDP in every geopolitical point zone in this country, in the Northeast, Northwest, North Central, in the Southeast, South, South, and Southwest. That's, that, that one of those competent people is sitting right next to you. My friend Badibo is simply an amazing person who has the sort of skill sets to be a leader in any other country. He'll be in very high demand. As a matter of fact, he is in demand here. And I, I'm, I'm very proud of his aspirations to be governor of Lagos State. But when you take into consideration that, that, that the potential of dividing here is dividing the party if we discuss ethnicity and religion as the primary tools to select our candidates is very high once we take into consideration all of our party's history. Instead of discussing that, let's discuss competence. I don't want my Oka, my, my, my principal, my Oka, to be discussed solely on the basis of solely on the basis of where he's come, he's from, or on the basis of the God who he worships. He's a competent man who has character, who has capacity, okay. and who has the content that is required in to lead the country like ours at the time. I'm going to have to send you an invoice for this campaign, but let's come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did ask him a question that he nicely evaded, but a judge has spoken. Edwin Clark has spoken. Many people are speaking on this issue. As much as we're saying for the good of the party, we can't run away from the zoning conversation. He said, if the PDP does not zone this ticket to the South. Now, the South is big. Let's not forget, mm -hmm. we have the Southwest, and most of the people we're seeing are from the Southwest. Um, we also have the South-South. We also mm -hmm. have the Southeast. Mm -hmm. And this is detail for both parties. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more people. Um, so... When he says, if this ticket is not zoned to the South, then the People's Democratic Party will lose its ticket. What do you presume this means? I, I, I'll say that the party itself is in a quagmire. And like I was speaking, I was saying earlier that the first person that broke this um, rotational, rotational um, movement of power between the North and the South that's really encoded in the DNA of the party was Good Luck Jonathan. This is a fact. You cannot, like he said, you cannot... But that's two governments ago. And we're, no, the, but, the but realities see, of Nigeria today... Exactly. It's not necessarily a good luck, Jonathan, problem, is it? No, it's not. But so the how issue, do we solve it? But the issue with that is when you have an equation that is that gives you the results that allows you to balance. You go from north to south, north to south. When you start taking out variables from that equation, you now start having a problem where some people will not agree to something. Right? You look at the way our national chairman emerged, right? It was a situation where it should go to the north. Right? And you see how 
a consensus happened without any force or anything and one person was produced and then all the other offices were zoned properly because that is what is in the dna of the party now you have a situation where some people will bring up what happened in the past some people bring up the fact that we've been ruled for eight years by a northerner we cannot say that the pdp is in a bubble and that did not happen because what happened the last time with the PDP was we had a southern president. So you have people coming from all sides of the divide. And that's why I say that Chief Body George has influence over delegates in the southwest and probably over delegates in the south. He has friends across the country. Same thing with Edwin Clark. The delegates are going to carry these ideas to the national convention. And this convention or this congress is going to be one that's going to be free and fair and the will of the people will emerge from that process. I have no doubt about it. Hmm. Well, I want to say thank you, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. We continue to keep our eyes on the story of zoning as it um, develops. Ilhaman Alnoja is a spokesman for Abubakar Bukala Saraki campaign organization and... Um, Badebo Rhodes Viva is a PDP gubernatorial aspirant for Lagos State. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for Thank being you. part of the conversation. Um, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking about uh, uh, the bills that the president has accented to so far. Well, the Senate president is saying he's accented to the most bills in history. We'll be right back. <laughs>